Welcome or welcome back to Microsoft Virtual Academy Security Fundamentals uh, course 98.367. Yeah, you've actually kept that the whole day without looking it up. It's actually pretty impressive. I keep waiting every time you see it. I'm like, 365, 366, nope. 367, 367. We are now at module five, we protecting are. servers and clients. Which is sadly our final module for this course. It is, it, the, the time has gone by pretty quickly. I am Thomas Willingham. I'm here with Christopher Chapman. Hard at work, as you can see. No. And we are here to facilitate and present information for you to help you better understand security in an overall conceptual manner mm -hmm. to kind of plant that seed for later so you're like, oh, wow, that security stuff was interesting and I know where to go or it was not interesting. I don't want anything to do with it, but I know that there are certain aspects I need to take care of that need to be mitigated. Yep. So let's talk about module five, protecting servers and clients. So the module overview, we're gonna talk about protecting your computer from malware, protecting the client computer, protecting email, the server, and securing Internet Explorer. So first of all, we'll talk about protecting your computer from malware. Malware, malicious software. Malicious software is designed to infiltrate or affect a computer system without the owner's informed consent. I think that's a little difficult because typically malware, the owner has consented but not the level of consent that the malware takes. So typically it's a Trojan horse type thing. Maybe somewhere, somebody's done a search on something that's uh, really popular at the time. Uh, Seahawks winning the Super Bowl, uh, Tennis Star, uh, Scarlett Johansson in the Super Bowl commercial. Uh, they've searched on the something. Uh, they've returned a list of results they click on a link, the link sends them to a website that when they dig into it and start clicking around into it, download something inappropriate to their system. So although they've consented to, oh, I'm doing the search, I'm clicking around, I'm moving around, there's a certain level of an action that's been performed that they didn't consent to or didn't know. Well, and the same can be true of actual software that they may install on purpose. There are plenty of applications out there, and malware is, is very definition dependent. For example, if I download certain software packages that I use on a regular basis at my home or in my office, they come with a disclaimer as part of the setup process. Pick your directory, pick your defaults. You get to that second to last page or so or tab in the installation wizard, and it says, would you like to install blank, blank, blank toolbar? Or search bar, exactly. or change your search page. I, or while it's not malicious software, it's software I don't want. And if I'm not paying attention and I'm just next, 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 I'm gonna end up with this software installed on my computer. At that point, in my head, it's malware, even though it may not be actual malicious software. They're trying to be helpful by not being the best search engine on earth and inserting themselves into a browser that is already built to use search engines that are better. Well, and, and that's, that's kind of why I went for that. An action's being performed that you didn't specifically consent to. Mm -hmm. Virus. So a computer virus is a computer program that can copy itself and infect a computer without the user's consent or knowledge. Early viruses performed in action. They were normally pretty harsh where they would wipe out your drive, uh, kill your processor, kill your memory. It, they were normally pretty harsh. They're, they still kind of are. Typically nowadays, they're macro languages or executables that redirect your search pages or bring up pop-ups, that unwanted pop-ups. So viruses are more of that nature. Initially, viruses used to be pretty destructive. Now they're less destructive and more, I would say honestly, most viruses nowadays are commerce-based. Or, or they're either commerce-based or they're just, they're, some of the ones we saw in the, 
I don't know, 2000 to 2004 period were more almost just about propagating. Like that was the whole point is just to get it out to as many computers as you could. And that was the whole purpose, it seemed, from what we saw of those viruses. Some of them were a little bit more malicious and actually did some damage, but a lot of them just, the point was to spread everywhere. And that was the biggest step one. But nowadays it's more, uh, I, I'm going to change your default search page or I'm going to change your default page. I'm going to create pop-ups that you have to click off of. Uh, I'm going to, when you perform a search, I'm going to inject search results in there. A worm. A worm, as Christopher just mentioned, is a self-replicating program that replicates to other computers over the network without any user intervention. Uh, different from a virus, a worm doesn't typically modify or corrupt files on a system. Instead, it consumes bandwidth as processor memory and just kind of chokes resources on your system. So uses your system for to, to uh, basically focus on this virus, or not this virus, this worm. So instead of being able to perform work, you're performing action on this worm. Yeah, and you'll see, this is another one of those terms, like we talked about routers, gateways, switches, how the terms have kind of gotten muddled over the years. Virus and worm have as well. They're... Yes, the definitions are very clear. The definitions don't change, but people will use them interchangeably. So, we're, when, personally, when I think of worm, I think more back to Unix systems. Worms to me are more like a Unix-oriented thing than like a Windows Server-oriented thing. That's just me, though. So, Trojan horse and spyware talked a little bit about this uh, executable program that appears as desirable or useful. Uh, maybe you're surfing the web and, oh, here's a perfect example. A uh, little information box pops up that looks very official. Your computer's infected by a virus. Click here to clean. Oh, I love those. Spyware is a type of malware installed on computers that collect personal information or browsing habits, often without the user's knowledge. You think about it superficially, and you're like, "Oh, that's not a big that big idea." Um, here, it, it'll collect some information, and we'll see what websites that I go to. Think about mail programs or sites that you surf that now all of a sudden have those targeted ads. So recently, you shopped for a coat for your pet for whatever reason. You have one of those pets that needs a coat because it's cold and you've searched for that. Now you've noticed you're browsing websites and you see those ads that all of a sudden are like petcoats.com. Get your coat a, or get your pet a coat. All of a sudden now you see these targeted ads that are looking at your browsing habits. To search engines, this is very valuable information. It, they can use this to profile you. And spyware enables a really high level of profiling that really enables whatever company is looking into the spyware to track what you're doing. Let's go ahead and take a look at Rootkit and Backdoors. Rootkit is a software or hardware device used to gain administrative level access to your system without being detected. A backdoor is a program that gives some remote unauthorized control of a system or initiates an unauthorized task without user intervention. So somebody has the ability to remotely access your system to have it perform some task. Protecting the client computer. So protecting against malware. There's a couple ways that you do this. One, keep your computer up to date with recent service packs and knowledge packs. The second is to ensure that you have a decent antivirus program. There's a couple components to an antivirus program. You want an antivirus program that will protect your computer. You want an antivirus program that will that will protect your browser. So as you browse the web, it kind of deflects 
with a really high level of Kung Fu uh, incoming attacks. And as these incoming attacks come in, it like brushes stuff away. A virus hoax. A virus hoax is more... You, this is the one you just talked about. A bit, yes. Oh, a perfect example. A uh, pop-up window comes up, says, hey, you have a virus. You click on clean here to click your... Because they, they look very official. Click here to clean the virus, and then it installs what it wants to install. Another virus hoax is more a social engineering type thing. And it's not only necessarily a virus hoax. This is also um, kid uh, had Pop Rocks and Coke and his head blew off and he died. Send that to all your friends. So now everybody's sending all these emails out about some kid who's stupid enough to do a whole bunch of Pop Rocks, put pe uh, Coke or Pepsi in it, or soda stream in their mouth, uh, their head blows off, supposedly, but now very concerned individuals are like, well, I don't want that to happen to Billy or Susie or whoever I know, so they start sending all these emails out. What does that do? Well, that clogs email systems uh, and, and is kind of hoax-ish, and what this does is it bogs the system down. So the system is so busy working on this kind of stuff that other stuff can kind of sneak through. Windows updates. So enabling Windows updates on your system to either automatically or for you to periodically go out and check, these keep your system updated with latest patches from Microsoft. Uh, it keeps your antivirus updated. Uh, ensuring that you have the latest fixes and patches, you keep Windows stable and secure. As Windows, as known exploits are brought out for Windows, patches and fixes are, re are released to mitigate these issues. WSUS and SCCM, uh, Windows Server Update Service. This would be the server that you would use on site to use these patches or to distribute these patches. So it's a main system. So you have thousands of devices on your network, thousands of computers on your network. Do you really want those thousands of computers to individually go to Microsoft, download those? Think about the network bandwidth. Think about your internet traffic. That can be really, really high. So instead, what you can use is a Windows Server update service to be a central funnel. So everything's downloaded to the Windows server, then you point your clients to this Windows server, then it distributes the patches. Although it's less job security. It's more job security if you have 5,000 client computers, you walk around to each one one at a time and do updates manually once a month. Download and install updates. Your finger Download. would be so sore. It might be, but you'd have a job forever. Just saying. It's, you know, functionality, efficiency, cost savings, good administration versus I want to keep my job. You know, it's, it's a trade-off. Yeah, but by using a WSS server, you can figure out other cool things and other cool directions that you want your network to That's go That's very in. true. Now, WSS and SCCM, terrific tools. WSS is actually an included tool now in server, if I remember correctly. There was one version where I remember the documentation said it was and it wasn't or it wasn't and it was, but it's there. Windows Server Update Services is all part of the OS. Config Manager expands on server update services with a ton of additional functionality and also includes updates. Kind of a neat little fact about SCCM, it doesn't replace WSUS. It actually just becomes a management abstraction layer for your existing WSUS infrastructure. So you're still going to need WSUS. Right. And the nice thing about these two tools is as patches come out, uh, we all have unique environments. Everybody uses a little bit different tools, a little bit different combination of tools. As these patches come out, it's, it's nice to verify that these patches don't cause or create any problems in your environment. Using WSUS and SCCM, C, ah, SCCM, you can basically create a delay 
of when these patches are sent to your clients, they give you a window of opportunity to test them and ensure that they work appropriately in your environment. You can make sure that the, safe, that the patch is safe to deploy, you know, click it, and then boom, it can go out to all the clients. Mm -hmm. User account control. Uh, if you've used, is it Windows 7 that has started? Windows 8. UAC? Yeah. Vista. Was it Vista? This was, yeah. I don't yes. remember it in Vista. It. <laughs> oh, it's, it says right there, on the slide, started with Vista. Well, and it's it's not so much that the slide said it, it's that I distinctly remember because, how do I word this politically correctly? It was one of the things about Vista that not People everyone were less was enamored excited. with. Exactly. We're not that happy with uh, some mm -hmm. of the UAC features. What UAC does is, again, gives you a level of protection from malware as low level changes are made to your computer, you're informed and says, hey, uh, this program's trying to make changes to the system. Are you sure you wanna do this, yes or no? Windows Firewall, so we've talked about Firewall before, can prevent hackers or malicious software from gaining access to your computer through the network. A mm -hmm. uh, firewall can also stop your computer from sending malicious. Remember there were two components to the firewall. One is incoming, the other is outgoing. Yep. And most, we can Most manage. people think about the incoming, not so much the outgoing. Not so much the outgoing. So we talked about protecting your computer. We talked about protecting your client. Now we're gonna talk about protecting your email. So spam filtering. Uh, there is a proliferation of spam on the network. If you have ever installed an email server and didn't get your spam filtering on it right away, you're, you just get inundated with a ton of spam. But if you use any type of email service, uh, Live.com, Outlook.com, there's some third-party systems that enable uh, web-based mail that you could use. They all use spam filtering. And what you'll note is you'll start to see spam of a certain type start to rise, and then all of a sudden it goes down. And then you'll see another type of spam start to come up and then go down. So what happens is, is these mail providers are monitoring this system and as they see a certain level or a certain type of spam come out, uh, they counteract it, they mitigate it. And then as that's mitigated, then the spammers basically jump to the next. Yep. Uh, many anti-spam solutions will also use a real-time black hole list RBLS or DNS-based DNS black hole list, which can be accessed freely. What this does is, hey, if uh, email comes from any of these domains, we're not gonna send it. This is fine, but we're gonna see how this can actually be circumnavigated through uh, hacking. Through a little bit of hacking, this can be circumnavigated so we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about what you need to do to, again, mitigate. Sender policy framework, email validation system designed to prevent email spam done with source address spoofing. So what this does is, so if we have uh, domain foo.com blocked, so there's no email from foo.com because they're known spammers, and foo.com is able to route through uh, email, because email servers not only send and receive email, they route email. So they receive incoming email and they're like, oh, okay, who's the destination, who's source, who's the destination, and they route it. If the routing functionality isn't locked down well, what can happen is, is a bad domain, foo.com, can send it to the routing server, the email routing server, and say, oh, I'm not foo.com, I'm somebody else. I'm emailisdandy.com. 
So from email, and then the server looks at email.isdandy, and they're like, oh, hey, that's a great place, and send that out. So if email for domain is not sent from a host listed in the DNS SPF, it will be considered spam and blocked. Mm -hmm. Ha ha, take that, nefarious emailers. Or people with your own email servers who don't know how to set up SPF records and might not be able to get email in and out of different networks. Correct, correct. SMTP Relay, actually I was just talking about this. Uh, simple mail transfer protocol, use transfer email from one server to another. Responsible for outgoing mail transport, uses TCP port 25. Again, talking about TCP and ports, networking fundamentals would be a great course to look into this further. Uh, you may think that your email servers are used only for your users to send and retrieve. This goes, this introduces that relay mail. Uh, you only want your internal servers to relay email through your mail servers. And spammers look for unprotected SMTP servers to relay their email through. And that's where we go through that, uh, if we, that center policy framework, SPF, to ensure the, it's basically an authentication, an identity authenticator. You are who you say you are. I agree. You are a trusted source, and I'll trust what you send me. So protecting your server. So protecting your server, again, the first step, physical security, where you place it. Uh, all, the way, it all the way back to module one. Uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, is, the phys is the server placed in a good physical location? Uh, I've seen servers placed in closets that when I opened it up, it was a huge rat's nest of cabling. And since there was no ve ventilation, it was like 140 degrees in this little closet area. That's not the best. And even though it was a locked room, they're like, well, we have it in a locked room. CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. If the server overheats and goes down, it's not going to be available. If it overheats and corrupts data, data integrity. So ensuring that it's not only a locked room, but a locked, well-ventilated room with stable access to power. So it talks about hardening the server. Uh, to harden the server is to reduce that attack surface, as we discussed earlier. Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. I was going to say that was a beautiful segue for my demo coming up. So, ta-da, there we go. I'm here to be of service to you, Christopher, and to set you up in the best possible method. I like it. Well, the slides do that as well. It's kind of nice. I can see it coming. I'm like, oh, I know what's going to be coming up here in a minute. Yep. So, we have the uh, MBSA, a software tool released by Microsoft to determine the security state of a system by assessing missing security updates. So it runs on your system and says, hey, per the baseline, here's what we've established as a reasonable baseline, and here's how you compare to that baseline. Mm -hmm. These are missing. Uh, this is enabled that shouldn't be in enabled. So, And then it gives you a report. Then from that report, you can evaluate and say, well, in my environment, this is okay, this is okay. Oh, I need to fix these things. One thing about security is awareness. One thing that you're going to find is security is a huge treadmill, and there's always new stuff coming out. Uh, there's always something new that will trip you up that you just didn't know about. And a lot of these holes that hackers and uh, nefarious people connect into are holes that, that are relatively new or that have been around for a while. And again, the information just hasn't been sent out to people, so they just don't know to correct these, these issues. That's why it's important to make sure that your uh, devices are updated and patched with, and the fixes are applied. Secure dynamic updates in DNS. So later versions of DNS enable dynamic updates of resources in DNS. This is good because we know clients use DHCP 
Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, C, Networking Fundamentals, for further explanation. But Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol enables the ability to temporarily get an address. So as a system has an address for a little while, it reboots, it has a different address. Uh, Dynamic DNS enables these clients, as they get new DNS addresses, to change and modify their DNS addresses and to modify their updates. This is fine, but we go back to DNS poisoning or adding incorrect DNS entries. We want to make sure that that's disabled. So with unsecured dynamic updates, any computer can create records on your DNS server, leaving you open to malicious activity. Again, uh, Microsoft.com can be redirected to uh, this website for badpurposes.com. It could be redirected to anywhere. And I've never, ever done something like that to a friend as a prank. That would be just good times, especially if it's something that they have to use all the time. Or so, well, yeah, yeah, definitely. Something mm -hmm. that they're expecting not what you set up to point to. Well, and so now secure dynamic updates in DNS, that's a pretty high level thing uh, done at a server level. We could, we, a person could change a host file locally, yep. so only that client computer is affected. Less fun than an entire network. True. That's totally true, but on a more targeted level, mm -hmm. you only want to target uh, users going to a specific website or whatever, download a new host file, overwrite, so now you have a new DNS entry. Uh, you look and say, oh, hey, I'm going to the right DNS server, I have no idea why I'm be, be, being redirected, then you look at your host file and see this new weird entry yep. in your host file. So now we have a demo. Christopher is going to show us MBSA. I am. Take it away, Christopher. So I've got on here, I'm all, I was all set up. There we go. Here it is. I've got the download. I've got the latest version. There has been an update put out for this uh, recently, post 8.1 and server 2012 R2. I'm going to actually go through the whole thing. I'm going to install it real quick. We're going to run it really quick. It's not a terribly long process. Uh, it's only 1.7 megs as an installer, so it's not like installing Exchange or SQL. And every now and then I like installing things like this because it takes 10 seconds. And as I say that, I jinx myself and it's now going to take two minutes. I'm going to sit here and stare at the screen while it thinks. You're going to will it to install faster. I did. See that? Look at that. Done. MBSA is installed. Check computers for common security misconfigurations. Now, this is a good thing. I'm running on a DC. I've made local group policy changes. I've made actual domain group policy changes. We're going to take a look. It's pretty simple. Scan. Computer name. It already wants me to scan this one. I have IP addresses. Uh, there are none listed in here. I can scan if I want to. I'm going to leave the defaults. Down at the bottom, you see, check for Windows administrative vulnerabilities, weak passwords, IIS, SQL, security updates. Just leaving this as is. Start scan. Now, I don't believe this will take too long, but we'll come back to this. If we want to go one more slide in, we'll come back and take a look at the sure. results of this. Okay, so next... Or we'll just keep looking at my demo. One or the other. I hear, I hear buttons. There we go. Hear, uh, so uh, next, we'll talk about securing Internet Explorer. So browsing the Internet. Browsing websites can expose you to a wide range of hazards. Can it really? It can. I, I've never seen a hazard on the internet. A hazard. I was browsing. I was a. I was a good web browser until I took an arrow to the knee. Oh yeah. Yeah. Look at what I did there. Look at look at me with the pop culture references. Nice, nice. Yeah. Totally bringing it. Um, if you weren't watching on the screen, I just got a fish bump. I, I didn't really. It was sad. Uh, today's browsers include pop-up blockers, the use of zones, and other built-in security features. Cookies and privacy settings. Now, these aren't the tasty chocolate chip or oatmeal cookies that your mother made. Or that no. I've been enjoying over here for the entire day. Yeah, very tasty. It was a very... Delicious indeed. Yeah, those were good. Uh, so... If you've noticed, you're on a website, 
you click off, you leave, you come back another day. And interestingly enough, how you set up things on that website last time, it's exactly the same this time. How did that happen? Cookies. Cookies are a little file that it puts on your system that just says, hey, you've browsed the system before and here's what the configuration looked like. Or here's what you looked up. Or, or here's what we, we showed you or whatever the case exactly, may be. Exactly, exactly. The problem with cookies is other websites can go in and browse those and that's where you start getting those targeted ads. Uh, and, and typically it's not that big a deal but it can cause a problem. What if your bank inappropriately puts a cookie on your system that's not written well? Uh, so it's a decent idea to periodically clear your cookies, to clear your cache, to set decent privacy settings. Uh, again, you take steps. Uh, when you leave your house, you lock the door. When you leave your house, you shut the windows. When you leave your car, you lock your car. So you just take an appropriate level of precaution to ensure that things are safe. Yep. How does your demo look over there, Christopher? Are we ready to... Yeah, we are. We are okay. indeed. It's up. It's ready here. Let's go back. So we're jumping back real quick to the MBSA demo. It ran. It's done. And this is what the report looks like. Report details for this computer itself. Um, it's nice. It could not complete one or more requested checks. That's what this little explanation point is telling us. I couldn't download the list from Microsoft of the latest security updates. And this tells me that, which is actually a good thing. It's a good demo. Uh, the reason I did this the way I did it is to make sure we got some problems, some things that don't work. This, uh, this computer's not internet connected, so I knew that was going to happen. Score, we've got green, we've got yellow, which is a, kind of a warning. It says non-critical. We've got these blue eyes, which are just best practices. They're informational. And then these, good, we're doing all right. We've got some user accounts have non-expiring passwords. I have accounts that those passwords will be the same forever, which gives hackers or attackers time to guess those passwords as time goes by. No incomplete software update installations were found. So this is good that there weren't any half updates done. But we temper that with the fact that we don't have the latest updates and can't actually check that because it's not internet connected. Windows Firewall is enabled and has exceptions configured, is enabled on all network connections. Now, this is best practice. It's not telling me something's wrong. So these are things that we like. Updates are automatically downloaded and installed on this computer. So this is just a setting. This can be, however, a little bit of a, of a miscommunication or misinformation. It's not telling me that they are all installed and I'm up to date. This report's telling me I have configured the system to automatically download and install updates, which is a good thing. It's what they want me to do. All hard drives using NTFS. No auto logon. Yes, you can configure this. Yes, you can configure this. I'm pretty sure for domain controllers. I don't know because I've never done it because it seems like a horrible idea. I feel like I did configure auto logon on a DC a couple of years ago as a test just to see if it would actually work, I think. I'll have to retest that now. It's been a long time. But you can definitely set up auto logon on any normal domain client member server. Uh, the guest account is disabled. Great. Proper, computers properly restricting anonymous access. Great. No more than two administrators. Excellent. So this is what this does for us. Now we've gone into IIS. Now we have some problems. Now this, IIS common files not installed on a local computer refer to the system requirements under this list. Now, is this bad? It says right here, unable to scan. So this is not that this is a problem. It's that it, it's, it's like the updates. It's not telling me up here. It's not telling me I don't have the latest updates. It doesn't actually know because it can't compare. So same thing here. It's just missing something. This is a bad one right here. See this? Big red shield with an X on it. Check failed critical. SQL server and or MSDE is running on a primary or backup domain controller. I'm running software on a domain controller that shouldn't be running on a domain controller. Whether or not that is a vulnerability issue or a resource issue, it could be either one. This software is just going to tell you what you've done. These, check not performed, it skipped a couple of things because even though SQL's on here, we couldn't get to it, which could be good. This could actually be a good sign. 
And again, it's an awareness thing. That error about SQL being on the domain controller, mm -hmm. for your environment, you could make the decision that that's what you want. But this brings, you, brings it to your awareness that, hey, typically this is a bad this thing. This is not what you want. Yeah, to this be is doing. not recommended. Are you sure this is how you want to proceed? At which point you get to make the decision, well, yeah, that is how I want to proceed. Oh, I didn't realize that wasn't best practice. Maybe I should move that yep. SQL server exactly. somewhere else. So it's a great tool. It's simple to use. You can use it to scan more comprehensively, but it's install it, open it up, pick your computer by default, hit scan, you'll, you'll see right away. The next demo is on IE settings. Uh, we talked about browsing the internet, blocking pop-ups. We talked about cookies and privacy statements, clearing your cache, clearing cookies. Content zones. Content zones enable you for different areas to have different settings. So within your local intranet, you can have a little bit more open than just on the internet. On my intranet, I want to have a little bit loose, more loose settings. Uh, trusted site zone. I know on the internet, I use these sites and they're trusted sites. So that'll enable you to download uh, files from those sites to uh, use ActiveX on those sites. So it just enables a little different level of security. By default, the later versions of Internet Explorer are pretty locked down and disable a lot of additional functionality. So if you want that function, again, it, it's risk versus mitigation. What do you want? How do you want to do it? Uh, I want increased functionality, but I know with increased functionality comes a little bit increased risk. You get to make that decision. We yep. don't make it for you. Uh, restricted site zones, so these sites are restricted. So let's go ahead and go to Christopher and let him uh, walk us through some IEEE, or IEEE, some IE, uh, I'm, I'm thinking standards again, some IE settings. Okay. I'm actually going to change my, uh, my criteria here just a little bit. And I'm going to close, and let's do this. Get this all done. So I'm going to open IE on this computer, and this is my actual desktop. There's a little quote there on the desk for anybody who wants to read it. Um, I wanted an actual live site to be able to look at. So, And I'm going to go back and forth between the two because of some specifics I want to show. So I'm going to go to my settings first. Um, and they're not, one of the things about IE, we have these icons up here. You've got your home, your favorites, your settings. These are not necessarily all of the settings. So I'm actually going to have to hit Alt, go to View, and I want to turn on the status bar. So down at the bottom, status bar. We're going to start by going to Bing. This will date this video. This picture right here that people will now see, they'll know when we made this video. Yeah, I, I have to say on Bing, these newer animated uh, graphics, they're pretty dang cool. They're not bad. They're not bad. Um, th what happens when you open these sites, these sites open in particular zones. They're auto-detected which zones they open in. This is an internet site. It's going to be an internet zone site. And what I mean by that, let's go in and actually look at these settings, internet options. The first page, the pretty straightforward, your home page you used to set. Start up with tabs or no tabs, tabs and browsing history. We'll come to this in a minute, but we're going to skip that for now. We're going to go right to security. Here are the zones that were on that last slide you talked about. Internet, intranet, trusted, and restricted. Bing opens an internet site zone by default. Within an internet site zone, there are a number of security settings. Right now, all these security settings are, in, are inherited from the category or the the overarching setting of medium high. Intranet, and an example of that would be on the computer I was on before, I go to localhost, I have installed IIS and forgotten how to spell. This is IIS on a local machine. This is an intranet site. I'm not going outside of my network. IE knows that. We won't get into the mechanics of how IE knows that, but it knows I'm on the local network. This is an intranet site. Now, that site also has its own security settings. And you'll notice, internet, medium high, 
intranet medium low. I can use more sites, I can gain more functionality, I'm trusting the sites on my local network not to be malicious. Uh, trusted sites is something I will configure. So let's say I trust Bing, I want functionality from Bing, or they've written something into Bing, which is not the case, but they've written something into it that doesn't work because of the settings within the medium high security category. I can add Bing to trusted sites. There you go, it's now added and I can get the functionality of trusted sites, which here you'll see is medium. Internet again, medium high, intranet, medium low, trusted, medium. I can change this, I can change it custom, I can go in and set individual settings for all three of these zones. So even if these don't work out of the box as default, you can still change them to make things work. And when you make changes in this area, for some of these changes you will have to uh, exit IE, yep. and restart it for those changes to take effect. Exit all instances of IE mm -hmm. running on your system. Yep. Basically, uh, so when IE starts back up, it can look at those settings files and take those new settings. Yep, that's true. So we'll jump back here real quick, and we'll look at this browsing history. We talked about those cookies. We talked about information being saved to your computer by sites. We can get rid of all of that right here. We're not going to go into all these. I mean, it's we're trying to keep this broad. I'm not going to spend a lot. It's not an IE course, so not too many details. Uh, this is the big one. Again, security. Privacy. This is cookie settings. Blocks third parties who do not have a compact privacy policy. Restricts first party. This is the only other tab we'll actually look at because it is security driven. We're trying to keep malicious information off your computer if we can help it. Um, the pop-up blocker. And disable toolbars and extensions when in private browsing starts. Anybody familiar with in-private browsing? It's pretty slick. You ever use it? I do. Let me close this and open this. So you use keystrokes to open that? I did use keystrokes. Control Shift P. There you go. Control Shift P is your friend. When in-private browsing is turned on, you'll see this indicator right here. Helps prevent IE from storing data about your browsing session. Includes cookies, temporary files, history, and other data. Toolbars and extensions are disabled by default. So this may be a somewhat limited browsing experience depending on the site you're going to, but all of the concerns we have for security aren't concerns on this computer. Now, that's usually a good thing, but it depends on your motives for turning on in-private browsing. That's so, all we'll say about that. So, well, okay, I'll, I'll give you an instance of why I use in-private browsing. I use in-private browsing because I have my uh, hot, Hotmail oriented account dating myself. I, I use Hotmail. I have my Hotmail account. Outlook.com now. Okay. It's still Hotmail though. It's, you still have the Hotmail. Yeah, so you should yeah. get an Outlook.com account and link to it. So yes, I, I, I've actually done that. I've, I've updated myself. But So I have my live account, my Windows Live ID, which apparently they don't even call it Live ID anymore. Now it's like your Microsoft account. Microsoft. Not confusing at all for employees of Microsoft, by the way. Correct. Log in with your Microsoft account. Okay. Okay, which, why, why no, that not work? that one. Not that one. Yeah, that's... So I have my, we'll just call it for this purposes, your Windows Live ID. I have my Windows Live ID, and I have my internal company-oriented Microsoft account. I have on some sites entries for both of these. Uh, Windows Azure. For Windows Azure, I have a Hotmail account that's attached to my MSCN subscription, and I have an employee account. As I log in, typically I want my Hotmail account, but there are times I want to use my Microsoft account. When I want to use my Microsoft account, I open private browsing because all those typical settings in a browser don't apply. So when I go to Windows Azure, it prompts me for login. It doesn't say, oh, I, I know what you want. It goes back to default behavior. Well, because it doesn't have anything to draw from. It's like, I don't, I have no prior history of you doing anything. Correct. So at that point, I'm able to log in with my alternate credentials and log in, perform whatever actions I want to perform, log out, and yet the credentials I normally want access using, I haven't hampered those at all. I haven't logged out, logged into another account, and, and basically 
interrupted this account system. So that's one of the ways I use it. Yep. Uh, another way that you could use it is to browse for presents for your significant other that you don't want them to be able to go into history and look for. This might be the best use of in private conversation I've ever I've ever had about IE. That is a very, very good use of in private browsing on your personal computer. I am here to be of service to the people out there. I'm going to remember that explanation forever. Yep. And so ever. so when it's time Valentine's Day, Christmas, birthday, whatever. Random Thursday. Random Thursday, and you're thinking, I need to give a gift for my spouse, significant other, whatever, pet. You're getting that coat from petcoat.com. You can do it. And it will not be tracked. And that dog will never know. Will never know. Won't know what hit him. They'll be, little puppy will be walking along. Next thing they know, they have a coat on, and they're like, holy crap, how did I get a coat? Because they... They, it, they couldn't find it in your browser history. No, nope, didn't see it coming. That's terrific. Just saying. I like that. That's great. <laughs> so I think that's, I mean, those are the IE settings we're going to go over. There are dozens more IE settings. We could be here for days. But again, it's not an Internet Explorer course. Those are the security yep. ones. The security tab that covers your actual security settings. The privacy tab, which covers your cookies. So that's, that's it for IE settings. And speaking of that being it, that's really it. Oh, awesome. We're closing that, off my E. So again... Microsoft.com slash learning. Yep. Excellent resource. That's that's what we got for security. So that's that's it. We have... I mean, that's, that's what we have for security in this course. In this there's, course. There's oh, there's yeah. We we've, we've barely scratched the surface. Yeah. That's me scratching the surface figuratively, not literally. I wish I had a surface. It would make more sense. Oh, see? Yeah. Now, that, that would be bringing the magic. It would. <laughs> that the sound effects added by our production team yep. in the bag. Well, again, the producers bringing the magic from behind screen. They are. They are indeed. So I think that, that covers it. So yep. yeah, we got our courses, books, uh, exams, this exam, line it up. Now you've taken this course. Uh, we do have some study guides available online that I do believe will be linked in this course. They'll be the study guides for the, the exam itself, so you can take a look at that and... Otherwise, watch for us next time. We've got two more of these infrastructure-based MTA courses to get up on MBA in the future. And I know that we're going to post this on MBA at some point, and there will not be any gauge of future or past. So no, they'll no. all four be there when I'm talking about putting up two more. They may all four. There are four total. So if there are four, we're not putting up two more infrastructure MTA courses. Yeah, so, so bottom line is there are four total. Uh, right now, there's one. There's one. As of the day we're recording this. There's one. This will make two. This will make two. Eventually, there will be there, four. There are two others. There are. Uh, look at the other content on Microsoft Virtual Academy. There is lots. Great to look at. content out there, and it's not just uh, administration content. There is development content. There is web-based content. Uh, IIS, a whole bunch of different language stuff. SQL. SQL stuff. Exchange. Anything that you would want to learn about Microsoft-oriented. MVA is most likely covering. Yep. Uh, yeah, mostly. We're yeah. getting there. Yeah. If we don't now, we will at some point. Uh, I, I'm I'm a huge... Per, I love MVA. I, I not only... I'm a presenter. I, I'm here because I believe in the program. But I, I watch a lot of you're the also, videos. You're also a client. I'm, I'm also... I'm not just the president. I'm a hair club member. So I'm not just a presenter. I'm a student. And I like it. I, I watch a lot of videos. Now, I'm not going to tell you how many of those videos I'm in and that I'm not just watching my own videos. I watch other people's videos because <laughs> that would just be awkward. Uh, I watch other people's stuff. Other people have some great content. That's how I learn. Um, hopefully, some people are watching my content. And we've actually gotten some emails that people are watching our content and have passed tests using our content. So, and, and if you're not, if you for some reason jumped into this and you're in module five without looking at module one, if you want our contact information, it's in the first couple of slides of the first module. Feel free to let us know if you're watching, if you're enjoying, if you want to see more different topics, whatever you want. And if we can't answer your questions, we'll get you to people who can. We'll get you the resources of people that can help you. So come back, That's come it. back, uh, watch MVA more. Yeah. That's all I got.